Okay, now let's talk about the vertebral column in the context of the back and answer the questions, what are the types, curves, and landmarks of the vertebral column? Okay, so here we have the vertebral column and it has the following components or types of vertebrae, thura, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal. Now if we zoom in a little bit more, we see them now color-coded and there are 33 total vertebrae within the vertebral column that are segmentally organized, cervical at top, down to the coccygeal at the bottom. And each vertebra is referred to by the first letter of its region simply for simplicity. So if we take all these and see the first letter, and we then say, okay, there is the fourth cervical vertebrae. So instead of saying that is the cervical vertebrae number four, we simply say C4. Now, um, let's go through each of these vertebrae uh, individually. So there's our cervical vertebrae and zoom in on them. And the cervical vertebrae are located between the skull and the first rib. And there are seven in total. And so the cervical vertebrae articulate with the skull atop with the C1 vertebra. And the C1 vertebra is also called the atlas. Um, there's C1, it's called the atlas because you remember the Roman god, Atlas carried the world on his shoulder, where C1 carries the skull on its shoulder. C1 is also the atlas. Next is C2, and that is also known as the axis, because if we see superior view in green, there's the axis vertebra with blue with C1, and the dens, which is a superior projection from C2, allows us pivot rotation or an axis, allowing you to do this kind of like no movement that we see here. There's C2, the axis. Next is C3, followed by C4, C5, C6, and finally C7. And the C7 has this very prominent uh, spinous process, projects at the back. And because it's so prominent, they call it the vertebral prominence. So in surface anatomy, if uh, you bend your, uh, flex your neck and touch your chin to your chest, you put your hand in the back, that's the most prominent bony sticky outie called the vertebral prominence. Okay, so some vertebral features that are unique to the cervical vertebrae include the following, include the following, a bifid spinous process, and bifid meaning it bifurcates, or there's two parts to this sp uh, spinous process. In addition, there are these transverse foramina, and these transverse foramina are these two holes in the transverse part of the vertebra, and within these transverse foramina, are these vertebral arteries. And the vertebral arteries are arising from the subclavian arteries and they supply the back of the brain. So if we now see this lateral view, there is the C6 vertebra and there's a transverse foramen. And notice at every segmental level, this vertebral artery traverses those transverse foramina until there it's that uh, suboccipital triangle and up into the brain as we see here, there's those vertebral arteries on either side and they come together to form the basal artery and this is what's supplying the posterior part of the brain. Cervical vertebrae. Now let's take a look at thoracic vertebrae. And there's 12 thoracic vertebrae which articulate with the 12 pairs of ribs. So there are 12 thoracic vertebrae and there's a rib. And there's one uh, vertebra and another rib and another vertebra and these two ribs that come off. And you see how that's working. For every thoracic vertebra, there's a pair of ribs that articulate and come off. And so there's T1 and T2 and T3 and T4 and then all the way down T11 and T12. 12 vertebrae articulating with 12 pairs of ribs. And the thoracic vertebrae have their spinous processes that are pointing inferiorly. This is something that makes them quite unique, where if we zoom in, there's a spinous process and another spinous process, and notice how they are uh, directed inferiorly. So if you actually take one spinous process that is pointing down, if you now go right across in the horizon, a spinous process of one vertebra let me say that again. The spinous process of one thoracic vertebra is oriented at the level of the inferior thoracic vertebral body. As you can see here, you're pointing to one. So there you're pointing to 12, 11, 10, 9. The spinous process of T9, it's lying in level with the vertebral body of T10. Okay? The lumbar vertebrae, there's five vertebrae, lumbar to L1 to L5. They have massive vertebral bodies to support the lower back. And so there we have our lumbar vertebrae. And you can tell where they're between because T12 has the last set of ribs. And there's T12. And then at the bottom, you've got the sacrum. And you can tell the sacrum because they're fused. And so then you just count in order. There's L1, then L2, 
And then between L1 and L2, there's a special junction that you can't see, but if you can find L1, L2, it's the caudal end of the spinal cord. So we zoom in, and we find the L1, L2 vertebral body, and then outlined there is the spinal cord. The end of the spinal cord is located between the L1, L2 vertebral bodies in that area. Then there's L3, L4, and L5. Okay, and then we find the sacrum. In the sacral vertebrae, there are five of them, but the, they're fused. So S1, S5 are five are fused. However, if we take a look at this, you can still actually see segmentally each region, each um, individual segmental seg uh, sacral vertebrae, but they're fused together to make one bone in a human. And then finally at the bottom, the coccygeal vertebrae that makes the tailbone, there's three to four fused vertebrae. Okay. So there's our vertebral column from cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccygeal vertebrae. Now the curvatures, there are primary curvatures and secondary curvatures, and they get their name, the primary curvature, because if we look here at a fetus, there is this C-shaped curvature that's formed, the first curvature, primary, of this individual that's in the fetus, and it makes a C-shaped. And so the part of the vertebral column that this thoracic vertebrae that retain the C-shaped curve we call a primary curvature or a kyphotic curvature. Now after birth with the demands of walking, weight bearing, and gravity, um, the cervical lumbar regions form a secondary curvature, also known as a lordotic curvature. So if we take a look at the cervical and lumbar region, we see a curvature that curves towards the front. That's a secondary lordotic curvature. Now the vertebral column uh, has certain landmarks. So next we're going to identify the major landmarks on a typical vertebra. This is a posterior lateral view of a lumbar vertebra. We're going to identify all these different parts or landmarks on it. These landmarks are the same for cervical, thoracic, lumbar vertebrae. I just have showing a picture of a lumbar vertebra. So the first is the spinous processes. It is the prominent bony stickyality. The way I think of it, a posteriorly pointing projection for ligaments and muscles to attach. There's our spinous process. Next is the transverse process. It processes a, a projection from the bone in the, in the transverse plane, side to side. The transverse processes are for muscle and ligamentous attachment as well. Then we also have our lamina. And the lamina is the smooth part that connects the spinous process back to the transverse process for ligamentous and muscle attachment. This is also the part that during the procedure of a laminectomy, this is the part that's cut out to access the vertebral canal. We have here a pedicle. Now the pedicle is what connects the vertebral arch, think uh, transverse process, to the vertebral body. So we can also see this in this lateral view that this part right here is the pedicle. Now looking in this lateral view, there is an opening which we use the word foramen, and it's between vertebrae. So we then say there's one vertebral, vertebral pedicle, there's another vertebral pedicle, and between them is this hole or opening or foramen. We call it an intervertebral foramen, but because that intervertebral foramen is transversed, traversed, pardon me, by a spinal nerve, radiologists also use the term a neural foramen for the hole where nerves traverse. Okay, so back to this view of a posterior lateral view. There we have these superior articular facets. And a facet joint is what allows for a synovial joint that articulates with its superiorly adjacent vertebra. And so there is a superior and there's an inferior articular facet. So we can now take a look at this lateral view where there's an inferior articular facet and a superior articular facet, and together they form wonder twin powers and it's called a facet joint where we see this type of flexion and extension movement that can go on in this facet joint. This is also this joint, it's also called a zygopophyseal joint, and it's filled with synovial fluids, and because it's synovial joint, you can crack knuckles. If you ever, like my young son, whenever he, I give him, I come home, he, he, I give him a hug, when I give him a hug, and he, he says, you cracked my back knuckles, is what he says when he means my back knuckles. The cracking sound that happens when you crack someone's back are from all these, the gases moving in these facet joints. It's a little bit of a tangent. Okay, now the vertebral body is located here, and a vertebral body is located anteriorly, and uh, uh, the vertebral body is anterior, and the spinous process is posterior in this view, okay? And the pars are interarticularis is located here. 
between the superior and inferior facets and the transverse process and pedicle, and that's where we find this pars interarticularis or the pars part of a vertebra. Um, all right, now the vertebral arch starts in the spinous process, and it's the part that connects spinous and transverse processes. That whole part of a vertebra is called the vertebral arch. And an intervertebral disc is located between these vertebra. There's a vertebra, there's a vertebra. So what do we call this? It's the disc between vertebrae, an intervertebral disc. And it has two parts. It's really made of fibrocartilage. And so the annulus fibrosus is this fibrocartilage on the uh, periphery. And the inside is this gel more gelatinous uh, substance called the nucleus pulposus. So the intervertebral disc is like a jelly donut. The pastry on the outside is the annulus fibrosus. The jelly on the inside is the nucleus pulposus. And the intervertebral disc allows for this type of flexion, extension, and compression movement in uh, the vertebral column at every segmental level. Now, the vertebral foramen, the whole, the word foramen means whole, and it's in the vertebra. So there is this vertebral foramen. It really is that whole region we call the vertebral foramen. If we move this over for a second, and we now take a, trans, a coronal section through the pedicles, the vertebral column looks like this. And so there, at that one vertebral level, is the uh, vertebral foramen. And there's another, and there's another. And we go shing and put all the vertebral foramen on top of each other. We call that the vertebral canal. And the vertebral canal then is all of those vertebral foramen stacked up end on end. And within the vertebral canal is the spinal cord traversing through that canal. Okay. Now to recap our vertebral column. The vertebral column is a group of segmentally organized vertebrae, seven cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, and five few sacral vertebrae that have bony landmarks labeled on this picture. And that, my friends, is a recap of the vertebral canal.